Hi, I'm Jonathan Weiner, and welcome to season six of Are You Listening? Today I'm going to talk about mastering at home. I'm assuming, first of all, that you don't have a $500,000 mastering studio in your home. Chances are your listening environment has some compromises that you've had to make. I'm also assuming that for many people, people are mixing and mastering in the same environment. Maybe you're mastering your own mixes. Maybe you're even producing and mixing and mastering your own music. So some of the perspective that I'm going to try to offer, and and maybe some of the strategies are designed to help you come to grips with some of those challenges. I'm assuming that for many of you, your uh, best monitoring environment may be headphones as opposed to speakers. And so one of the things I look to address is, well, if I don't have great speakers, are they even useful and in what way? The biggest challenge I want to call out is mastering your own mixes. I assume when you set out to write a piece of music and manifest it in arrangement and record it and mix it that you've spent lots of time, hours and hours and hours, getting it to make it sound the way that it sounds and come together in the way that it comes together. Then when the time comes to master that, you have to ask the question, well, I've done the best that I can. I'm responding to what I'm hearing in my environment. Everything that has come to be has come to be for a good reason and based on decisions that I made along the way. And now I'm supposed to change that. Well, how does that make any sense? One of the first lines of defense, shall we say, or the first useful pieces of information that I would offer is understand mastering. You know, I mean, that's why you're here, right? Is you're watching all these episodes of Are You Listening, presumably, and there's the isotope mastering guide and there's there are lots of resources to help understand the the sort of core discipline. When you investigate mastering, when you start learning about it, at the core of it is making small, subtle changes to map the artistic vision to what the end user is going to experience by changing the tone, maybe adjusting the dynamics, adjusting the level a little bit. You're not writing the music in mastering. It's not really where the major creative act is taking place. And just keeping that in mind can keep you out of trouble, can keep you from getting to the point in the mastering stage where you look at your own mix and say to yourself, oh my gosh, I have to change this all over again or do something here. Sometimes it's just a matter of very small and subtle changes. And when you investigate mastering more and more, you begin to understand that the small and subtle changes, while they make real impactful differences, if they're done carefully, maintain the fidelity, the structure of of a production that you've made. So starting with the sort of notion of when we're mastering, we're looking to do as much as necessary to make something translate well, but as little as possible. It's not the time to completely reinvent the wheel. That's tip number one that can help keep you out of trouble. I've talked in other episodes about references and how references can be helpful in terms of understanding genre, helpful in terms of understanding tone and tonal balance and level. But we need to stop and think for a moment about the quality of the references that we use. In the context of home mastering, this is doubly important. We're gonna lean into the references that we're using to help us understand the absolute sort of qualities of the signals that we're comparing our work to So we need to make sure that we have great fidelity references. It may feel a little bit like diving into the weeds, but if we are comparing mixes and especially our masters against audio that's been converted to a lossy file format, an MP3, an AAC to some extent, or an OGG file prevalent on a lot of, or some of the streaming services, including Spotify, there is a bit of degradation to the fidelity of the original signal, it's small, but it's real. And if that becomes your basis for comparison, and you're trying to make your work sound like something that's been slightly degraded, I think you can see where that becomes problematic. It almost becomes a compound problem because you might describe a a relatively low quality OGG render of a mix as sounding kind of thin and hashy and a little bit gauzy. And if you make your mixes sound that way, 
and you bounce out a WAV file or a lossless file, and then that gets converted to an OGG file, you'll get that signature of the change of the sound doubly. The ways that you can avoid this problem is seeking out lossless audio. It doesn't mean that you have to go out and rebuy your entire library of songs, but pick out your favorite five, eight, ten references and buy the files. Go to platforms where you can actually find the lossless version of the audio. The second advantage of that is when you buy it and have the file living on your hard disk, the level will be exactly the same level at which it was produced. When we're listening to streaming services, sometimes there's loudness normalization and adjustment to the playback level that comes into play. And when we're mastering, that's problematic. It's fine for consumers, but it's not great for us because we're trying to make sure that what we're comparing against represents the audio that came directly off the mastering engineer's desk to the greatest extent possible. If you're at a loss for where to find uh, releases that would qualify as good references, one place you might go is every year in the Grammys, there's a category that's called Best Engineered Album. There's the classical and non-classical versions of this. If you scan that list, those are curated examples that are curated by a list of high-achieving professionals that I've identified these as especially good-sounding records. So that's one place to start. If you do a Google search that says 10 great-sounding dubstep records. I don't think anybody's making dubstep records anymore, but you might want to. It might make a comeback. You don't know. So by doing a little bit of research, you can start to curate your own list. I keep a folder in my Dropbox that's called References that is subdivided by genres and subgenres to some extent, and it's always available to me at my fingertips uh, for when I feel like I need to dip in and get some perspective. Spending a little bit of extra time and energy and, dare I say, a little bit of money Downloads don't cost that much money. A little bit of money to get good sounding references can be invaluable. Assuming that you're mastering your own mixes and working in the same environment, there's a fundamental problem that you're going to encounter. If there is anything that's inaccurate about your monitoring environment and that shows up imprinted in your mixes, and then you're mastering in that same environment, well, you're still encountering those same issues and those same problems. And so it's a little bit hard just by listening to the sound coming from your speakers to understand where the anomalies are and where the problems are. And we live in this period of time where we have amazing technology like tonal balance control, LUFS metering, or the different kinds of meters that we have available to us. By leveraging those tools, we can at least keep ourselves from sort of further going down the rabbit hole and compounding the errors that we've made in mixing. Using tonal balance control is a great way to understand where your work may be falling really, really far outside the lines when you're mixing, and maybe in mastering how you can think about your EQ tools to get you back within the lines and also give you some insight into maybe where your monitoring environment might be falling down. Headphones is a great way to um, overcome some of the anomalies that we have in listening to speakers. But of course, headphones aren't perfect. There are things that are very different about how we perceive sound listening through headphones than listening through speakers. We don't image the same way. Our experience of reverb and depth is different. Our experience of very low frequency signals and high frequency signals relative to the mid-range is very different. So for all those reasons, having tools like tonal balance control can really help you keep perspective. Underneath in the show notes, you will see links pointing at other episodes that talk about using these tools, and you can find information about tonal balance control and how to use it as well. For many people, the best playback experience is going to be playing back in headphones. Due to the cost of creating a fantastic acoustic environment that will allow good speakers to sound great. There's a lot of debate about whether you can make masters in headphones that translate. There is no hard and fast answer to this. It is entirely possible to make use of great headphones, learn the headphones, observe what happens when your mastering work translates out into the world where people are listening on speakers or headphones and do good work. But the fact remains that there are real differences. You know, the, the simplest way to understand this is 
If you have two speakers, the sound of both speakers gets to both ears. You've got crosstalk across them. With headphones, you don't have that so much. You only have the sound of a driver into one ear and the other driver into another ear. There are software tools that allow you to create this uh, or simulate this crossfeed to simulate something that's more like listening through speakers. But it turns out that even the way that we understand timbre and stereo imaging has to do with the way sound bounces off the front of our heads. It's not just only to do with the sound going directly into our ears. It has to do with our physiology. So you can't really fully replicate the experience of listening to speakers in the air when you're listening in headphones. So there may be ways in which, in fact, there are ways in which listening through speakers, even if they're not the world's greatest speakers, can give you some information and some perspective about the work that you're doing. A lot of it has to do with stereo imaging and making sure that you don't have a sound that's too wide. Some of it has to do with the relationship between high frequency information and mid-range and low end. You can listen through headphones and convince yourself that you can hear everything in the mid-range. You can hear the lead vocal, you can hear whatever the lead instrument is, and not notice that you have excessive bass and treble. And then when you play the sound through speakers, you notice that the mid-range or the sound of your lead instrument is kind of recessive. So even if headphones are your primary modality, taking a moment and checking in with your speakers just to check the parameters of the stereo image and the edges of the frequency uh, spectrum can be extremely helpful. When you're evaluating speakers that may be more or less appropriate to master, here are some basic things to think about. When we're dealing with mastering compared to mixing, being able to hear very low frequency information becomes essentially important for a couple of reasons. Mastering is the time to make those final changes. And if there's a problem with the very deep bass and the very deep low end, you need to be able to hear it to know it's a problem to fix it. You know, a big plosive in a vocal or some hum or something like that, that's something you want to know about. The other thing is, frankly, understanding the interaction between the bass signals in a mix, if there is like an 808 kick drum or a heavy kick or something in a limiter, to really be able to psych that out and understand that interaction, you need to be able to hear the low end and the way the low end changes when a limiter is introduced. So these are reasons why hearing the low end is important. Very, very small box speakers probably won't give you as much of that low frequency information as would be ideal. Having a six and a half inch driver, no matter how great the speaker construction is, if there's just a single six and a half inch driver in a small box, you're probably going to see real world bass rolling off at 80 hertz or 70 hertz or something along those lines. So you're omitting two solid octaves in the low end that you're not going to have access to. If you had the ability to get a larger speaker that could portray the low end, great. One possible solution is to get a subwoofer. Introducing a subwoofer into a system can be really helpful. It takes some time to set them up properly because now you've got two speakers and you're trying to manage the frequency response across the entire spectrum between the box that's carrying the mid-range and the high end and the subwoofer, get them to be phase aligned and also get them to be level matched well enough so that you get enough accuracy. But subwoofers can be really helpful. They can also be more economical than buying large speakers. If you have a relatively small room, you can place the subwoofer in different places as opposed to trying to accommodate a larger speaker box. There's different kinds of speaker technology from a basic level. There are passive speakers and active speakers, the difference being that passive speakers require an external amplifier. Most people nowadays are using active amplifiers, and that means that there's an amplifier actually in the box. It's usually a digital amplifier, a class D, or in some cases a class H amplifier. They are optimized for the speaker. By optimized, I mean they're well matched to the speaker and they work pretty well. The only disadvantage there, apart from the fact that you can't change out the amp, is that if your amp goes south, you don't have a speaker anymore. You can't just swap out the, the amp. But the other thing to keep in mind is that 
Most speakers that are manufactured these days sound pretty good in anechoic chambers. The minute you put them into a room, they interact with the room. So if you walk into a room and you listen to a speaker and you think to yourself, wow, this speaker sounds a little funny to me, it may be the room that's causing the speaker to sound funny. And by improving the room, your speaker might actually sound better. So don't be too quick to judge a speaker based on a single listening environment. And certainly if you go to a showroom and are just listening across a whole bunch of speakers on a shelf, chances are none of them are going to sound as good as they possibly could, well-placed and in a good environment. Working in a home studio almost always means having some compromises between living space and the performance from an audio standpoint of your listening environment. You know, one of the things that I remind my students is this is kind of a, a long journey. When I started out mixing records myself, I was working in a little basement room that I built myself out of sheetrock and wood framing and I was mixing on Yamaha NS10s, which are known to be, you know, decent speakers for judging balance, but to my way of thinking, they're not great sounding speakers, and they're certainly not a mastering reference. The thing that I experienced was, at some point, I started to run into limitations in terms of my work. I couldn't quite get the low end right, and I, I couldn't hear the nuances in the high end. And so I began to, to think, okay, my work has gotten to a point where I want to get to the next place, the next level. What am I going to do to improve my environment? And so I upgraded what I could upgrade, upgraded the speakers, and then I moved to a different room. And 15 years later, I found myself in a proper studio that I built out from the ground up with a room inside a room, et cetera, et cetera. So that's all a way of saying to make your environment sound great it doesn't make sense to do it all at once. It's a journey. You can make little incremental changes along the way. But there are some very basic things that you can do to make sure that your room from the get-go performs as well as it can. Some ideas such as making sure that the dimensions of your listening position compared to your speakers is an equilateral triangle. Your listening position should be the same distance from each speaker, and those two speakers should be the same distance from each other. To the extent that it's possible, minimize the hard surfaces and the, the reflections. So if you have the opportunity to orient yourself so that the, the windows in a room are behind you instead of in front of you, or uh, if you have a lot of glass in front of you that you put some drapes over the windows while you're working to, to minimize the reflections. Get your speakers up off of a desk to make sure that there's not interaction between, especially the tweeters firing off the desk and then causing some comb filtering and some pollution in the, um, the imaging. Also make sure that the tweeters are firing more or less at your ears. Can't count the number of times that I've walked into rooms where the tweeters are four feet up in the air and the, the chair has somebody's ears, they're sitting way back and they, their ears are about a foot and a half below, you won't get as clear a sense of direction, as good a sense of imaging or tonal balance from speakers in those scenarios. Another sort of basic principle of setting up a listening environment creates some diffusion behind the listening position. Diffusion in this case means no flat surfaces that will reflect the sound directly back to the listener. Low budget way to create diffusers is to put a bookcase behind you, fill it with some books of different depths in the, uh, in the cavities of the bookcase. That can help break up the sound field and break up the reflections and have the room sound a little bit better. There are lots of resources that are available to help with the basic setup of a listening environment. And many of these strategies don't really cost you anything. You know, maybe you'd spend some money on speaker stands, maybe you spend some money on a bookcase, and then, you know, go to a yard sale and buy a bunch of five cent books. I think I saw one of those last week. So they're still out there. Doing what you can to improve your environment. And then when you get to that point where you notice every time I work on something, it seems like the low end isn't quite tight enough or it seems like the sound is bright overall, at some point that becomes the impetus for making an additional change either to the gear or to your setup when it makes sense for you to do so. 
A technology that's come into our studio world over the last 25, 30 years is something called DRC, or Digital Room Correction. Before we had DRC, it wasn't that unusual for people to put EQs on speakers to try to kind of align the tone of the speakers playing into a room. But what DRC tools do is they take a snapshot of the room reflections and basically try to correct for the reflections in the sound that's coming from the speakers. These tools can actually be very helpful in aligning the speaker to a room and to the time domain or the reflection response of a room. When you're using them, you shouldn't expect perfection. You can't uh, defeat the laws of physics. The dimensions of a room are the dimensions of a room. They're only going to be able to get you so close to perfect. And frankly, in the same way that you don't necessarily want to make one record sound like another 100% because of the intensity of the filtering that would be required to do that, the same is true with DRC. If you tried to fully correct for room anomalies, the processing would start to introduce problems itself. So usually the corrections that are implemented are somewhat general. You can improve the performance of speakers in a room, but you shouldn't expect it to make a room sound perfect. You also should understand that you're correcting for a listening position. So when you implement DRC, it means that the sweet spot of your listening environment will become smaller. And as you begin to wander further away, especially if you've optimized it to work as well as possible from your mix position, if you wander away from that position, it may actually sound worse than if you didn't have the DRC engaged. So if you have the band sitting six feet behind you and they're listening, you might expect them to notice that some things sound kind of wonky when you're using this software. Um, but it can be a relatively inexpensive way to make an initial upgrade. It's certainly no substitute for a great listening environment, uh, but it can be a very useful tool. There are some issues around the physics of sound and the way that it works in a room that a DRC just can't fix. Having too much reverb in a room is going to be problematic, and digital room correction cannot fix that. In order to deal with that, you need some kind of sound absorption, some paneling, some diffusion, uh, a couch, you know, carpeting, something to kind of deaden a room. Singers, uh, when they're singing a vocal during a recording session, like to have a little bit of reverb. If you give them too much, they will have trouble hearing their own pitch. And very often we'll find out later that they've been singing out of tune because all of the reverb, all of the echo in the sound is covering up some of the important cues that they would have needed to be able to hear themselves well enough to control their pitch. There's a kind of an analogy to this in mastering or to mixing as well. If you have too much echo and too much sound showing up late field while the next sound is propagating through the speakers, it can be hard to really get a sense of the clarity of the sound overall. You could actually flip that all the way around it's also really hard to sing in tune if your room's too dry. Uh, and horn players experience the same thing. The optimum reverb time in a listening environment is about a third of a second. And that's kind of what acousticians will aim for, give or take, uh, for a critical listening environment, depending on the size of the room. DRC is helpful, but there's certain kinds of things that it simply cannot compensate for or account for. Could we foresee a future where technology would allow us to not have to worry about the acoustics in an environment? I, I think we have to allow for the possibility that as time goes on, the answer could be yes. And frankly, there are people now who are mixing in headphones. I was talking to Andrew Sheps last week about the record that he was mixing in headphones. There's a mastering engineer named Glenn Schick, who for years and years now has made a, a career out of mastering in headphones, and he'll actually go to the artist and master where they are, as opposed to having to send the, the files to him. Uh, it's a nice way to travel, too. For my part, I, I love sitting in a beautifully tuned room with great speakers listening to music. There's something emotionally sort of stirring and moving and wonderful about that experience. It is truly immersive, but that doesn't mean that it's the only way to do it, and it doesn't mean that it's a requirement for anybody. 
for mastering engineers that are working in highly tuned, high performance environments where there's relatively even frequency response in their environments, it's easy to rely on what you hear as an indication of spectrum and therefore how a master is going to translate out into the world. When you don't have that, you might have to start relying on some other strategies to help you understand how what you're working on is going to translate. I talked about tonal balance control, that's one. Something that mix engineers do fairly frequently is take mixes and listen on different playback environments. You listen on your phone, you listen on the car, you go over to a friend's house and listen on their playback environment. Mastering engineers at the top of the discipline typically don't do that very much because they can rely on their sort of ground truth, if you will, which is their playback environment. But if you don't have that quality listening environment, then doing the same thing makes a great deal of sense. And even to the point where you might play something for friends, like use your friends nicely, right? Invite them to make comments about what they hear. Play somebody a master of a song. You might even play them the before and the after, the mix and the master, and just ask them what they hear. Don't bias them. Don't try to coach them in any particular way. Just see what they have to say. See if they offer you some feedback like, you know, it sounds a little thin, or it sounds blurry, or I can't hear the voice, or whatever. Getting perspectives from other people is invaluable, even in the context of mastering, and it might be especially helpful when you are working in that echo chamber of your own production environment and spending most of the time just working by yourself. An advantage that professional mastering engineers have, there's usually a deadline and a budget. This sounds kind of glib, but in fact, when somebody gives you a project to work on, you know that there's only so much time that you can spend, and that time typically translates into money that a client is going to spend on mastering. The helpful thing about that is you have to get across the finish line. You have to make decisions. Obviously, you hope that you're making good decisions and you're confident about them, but you get to the point where you can call it done. You can pour, put a fork in it, so to speak. When you're working on your own material, you don't have the advantage of having a deadline. So how do you come to terms with that? Because if you don't have a release date deadline and you don't have a client that you're working for, you could spend way too much time getting across the finish line. So here's just one helpful thought. If you find yourself working on a project and you get to the point where all you can do is make something sound different, but you're not sure that you're making it sound better, stop. You're done. Put it away. Send it off into the world. Go on to the next thing. You can come back and look at it three months later or six months later or a year later. You know, it's true even for mastering engineers and mixing engineers, I think, at the top of the craft that when you're done, there's always this little voice in your head saying, I wonder if it could have been just a little bit better if, but you have to let it go. And so put yourself in that situation where you just let it go and move on to the next one. Everybody's home studio looks somewhat different from each other. Uh, and there are some extremely well tricked out home studios. And then there's the self producing musician who's doing everything from the production all the way through mastering in a room and just getting started. Hopefully some of the things that I've been talking about will help you navigate the challenges either where you are right now or where you're going to be. Just enjoy it wherever you are. You know, every time you run up against that wall, uh, embrace the possibility of making things even better. And as always, check the show notes underneath this episode for links to other episodes and for resources to help you research this even more. And thanks so much for watching.